Is the Passion of the Christ Biblical? Next month, we celebrate the resurrection, and I decided to kick off a month of examining and explaining aspects of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ with this Is It Biblical movie review. I remember when The Passion came out in 2004. I had friends who saw it and told me it was really good, and I didn't believe them. I've never known Hollywood to get Bible stories right, especially when they deal with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's face it, a huge majority of actors and directors are unbelievers, and many of them actually have an atheistic agenda. And a lot of Bible-themed movies, they don't even try to get it right. I'm seeing this more and more as I put out these reviews. That's why I was so surprised when I watched The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. Gibson is not known for his morality, but he put out a film that not only got a surprising amount correct about the crucifixion of Christ, but shockingly, as I was watching it, I could tell that he actually was working to be accurate. They went out of their way to try to get this movie right, and I'm going to point out a few things they got wrong, but there's no way I have time to count all the things they got right. So I'm just going to start them off with 50 points in the positive to keep it simple. There's a few parts of the movie that are not based on scripture, but as long as the Bible doesn't give us indication that a scene was necessarily wrong, I'm going to chalk it up to artistic license and let it slide. Like in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Satan appears and tempts him, and he stamps on the head of a serpent. Of course, this probably didn't literally happen, but it's deeply symbolic and demonstrates what theology calls the Proto-Evangelium, or the first prophecy of the Messiah found in Genesis 3, that he would crush the head of the serpent. So the fact that it's included shows just how committed the writers were to being true to scripture. So here's what they got wrong. Okay, I'm being picky, but the Bible says that Jesus fell on his face to pray from the beginning, and the film has him standing the first time. In my defense, I kind of have to be picky because this film was pretty good. Also picky, I know, but Jesus would not have had long hair. Paul wrote that long hair was considered a shame for a man, and the only time that a Hebrew would have had long hair would be if they had taken what is called the vow of a Nazarite. Like Samson in the Old Testament, which prohibited them from a lot of things, including cutting their hair ever, so it would have been really long, and drinking wine, which would not be true of Christ. Another thing I notice is that Jesus says that he doesn't want the disciples to see him like this. But that seems wrong. I mean, this moment was going to be recorded in his word for all generations to read, and Jesus knew that. So it just seems off. Also, after Jesus woke them and told them to watch, Peter, James, and John actually fell back asleep, so they would not have been watching Christ pray. Alright, let's get forward to the betrayal scene. The movie has a reluctant Judas trying to run away and only kissing Christ and betraying him after the soldiers have already declared that they are seeking Jesus of Nazareth, and after Jesus has already admitted, I am he. This is a little backwards. Judas actually told the soldiers to arrest the man he kissed, and it seems they were in hiding while he approached Christ to give him the kiss. After the kiss, the soldiers came and Jesus asked, Whom seek ye? When Jesus says the powerful words, I am he, they actually all fell backward. By the way, if I were a soldier, this is the point where I would throw up my hands and run. Something else you'll notice throughout the movie are the lines from Mary speaking as though she understands what is going on and is in on the plan of redemption. But in scripture, Mary is not said to have any more understanding than any of the other disciples. In fact, she went to the tomb on resurrection day, expecting him to still be dead. Also, Peter and John both call Mary mother in the movie, as if they recognize her as holding some special position for bearing the Christ child. Which, of course, is not true. She was privileged to be the Lord's biological mother, but in Scripture, she is not elevated above other disciples of Christ. Okay, so during the trial, the movie shows Peter first denying the Lord to a man, and his third and final denial was to a woman. But in the Bible, he first denies Christ before a maid, or a young girl. This was actually the same maid that had led him into the outer court of the hall where the trial was taking place. 
John, who was present for the trial, had sent the maid to let Peter in, so she knew he had to be a follower of Christ like John. Knowing this, when John looks surprised to see Peter, you know that's also not how it happened because John's the reason Peter was there. Also, John probably didn't see Peter because John was inside the hall for the trial and Peter waited outside at the fire of coals. Then there's the scene where they show that Mary Magdalene was the woman caught in adultery whom Jesus had forgiven and saved from being stoned. Mary Magdalene did have a shady past, but not from adultery. Jesus cast seven demons out of her, but afterwards she was one of his most devoted followers. Since the story of the adulterous woman seems to take place after Mary's conversion, it's very unlikely that she would have been that woman in adultery. Skipping forward some more, I really like how they show Simon being literally compelled against his will to carry the cross. This is scriptural. There's a lot of conjecture about how he carried the cross. Some say that Simon carried the whole thing after Jesus had carried it, so Jesus walked behind. Others say that he carried the front and Jesus carried the back. It seems unlikely that they carried it side by side, but I suppose it's possible. It's been said that they may have only been carrying just the top beam of the cross, and this seems likely because two giant beams of solid wood would have been nearly impossibly heavy to carry any distance. So let's talk about the scene at Golgotha, or Calvary. The movie shows only three of Christ's followers present at the cross, John, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene. But scripture tells us that there were many women there who were his followers. As a matter of fact, it seems that most of Christ's female followers were present at the cross, though all of his male followers had fled except for John. Then the movie shows Jesus being nailed to the cross, but the nails are placed in the palms of his hands. This would have definitely broken the bones in his hands, but it's actually a really important prophecy that Jesus did not break any bones during his crucifixion. So this is wrong. Besides, the Romans knew that putting nails in the palms could result in the victim's flesh tearing and his hand slipping free from the nail. Instead, Romans knew to put the nails in the wrist, between the bones of the arm. This would prevent the victim from tearing free and would still be considered in the hand by the standards of the day. As far as the seven statements that Christ made on the cross, I was glad that the movie got all of them correct, except for one that was out of order. The woman behold thy son line came before the I thirst line in scripture, but it's backwards in the movie. All right, so there's one I really hate that they got wrong. The movie shows the darkness at the ninth hour as just a bunch of clouds that cover the sun. But the Bible says that there was darkness over the whole earth and that the sun was actually darkened. So it was much more supernatural than what is portrayed here. I love that they got the earthquake right, even if the veil of the temple shown in the movie is much smaller and thinner than the one that would have been there in real life. So the last thing they got wrong was that during the earthquake, the soldiers immediately checked to see if Jesus was dead already and thrust a spear into his side to verify. But this didn't actually happen until after Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. That's when Pilate sent men to see if Jesus was really dead already. Also, Mary, Mary, and John weren't the ones to take down his body. That was Joseph too. Now, the story of redemption is actually more about the fact of the resurrection than it is about the crucifixion. So I would have liked to see more emphasis on the resurrection in the movie. But that being said, I still thought the ending where Jesus stands and walks out of the tomb was pretty cool. So there are some parts that are only put in there because of Gibson's Catholic background, like the honoring of Mary and the shroud that Jesus wipes on his face but these are really not heavily emphasized. Also, there are some creative things that they added, like Judas seeing a bunch of devils that look like children, and the devil walking around with a demon baby. Most of that didn't go against scripture. I think the writers just added it for effect. Pretty much all of the rest of the film was spot on, and I thought it was fantastic. Some of my favorite parts that they got right were the sweat drops of blood in the garden, Jesus looking at Peter after he denies him the third time, 
the fact that Jesus was put in prison for a short time before the crucifixion, the fact that he was sent to Herod before being sentenced by Pilate, and my personal favorite, the moment when Pilate revealed him to the people and said, Behold the man. That was powerful. So my total comes to a positive 34, which is a great score and is probably less than the film deserves. It's not perfect, but it's by far the best biblical movie I've reviewed so far. What sets it apart is that Gibson clearly made a real attempt to be accurate in his portrayal, and for the most part, he succeeded. What do you think? Have you seen The Passion of the Christ? Is there anything you noticed that you think I've missed? Let me know about it in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. I really appreciate it. Also, I want to remind you that the whole Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible teaches that all men are sinners and that no sinner can have eternal life with God in heaven because we must pay for our sins for eternity in hell. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Since our sin has been paid for by Christ, all that is left for you to do is to accept that gift by faith. If you've never accepted the gift of God by faith, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a message and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.